The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, we're in Romans chapter 15, working on verses 8 through 12, uh, starting with page 5 of your notes and moving on to page 6. <clears throat> I don't have to tell you all that we are at the end game. This is not the time to mess up spiritually. Okay? This is the time to be in Bible class, to make whatever sacrifices you've got to make in order to continue your spiritual momentum. It would be a shame for you to use something as an excuse for not being here. Make every effort, and God will bless it. Uh, so we're here, so let's uh, be sure that we are of the right frame of mind, in fellowship, and ready to concentrate on something that is a part of the Word of God for believers who care. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We thank you that our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ has overcome the doom of the cosmos. We thank you for the prospect of the upward call and everything you provide for us so that we can continue our momentum in these times we find ourselves. In Christ's name, amen. The other night I had that thing uh, uh, about uh, Russia and how messed up we are spiritually, and I didn't have it printed out, and it's real short. Uh, he, made, he made a decree on spiritual and moral values back in November. The enemy, it proclaims, is the U.S. and, quote, other unfriendly foreign states, end quote, intent on the cultivation of, quote, selfishness, permissiveness, immorality, the denial of the ideals of patriotism, and destruction of the traditional family through the promotion of non-traditional sexual relations. This is the leader of Russia. You won't find anything like that from those in office today, pretty much. Nothing. Even close. So that's the state we're in. And uh, it's, 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 it's a shame, but it's the way it is. Okay, the principles that we've been studying here as applied to Jews and Gentiles. Let's read this and pick up where we left off. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision, that's the Jew, on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. And for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy as it is written, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and I will sing to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Third quote, and again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And verse 12, again Isaiah says, there shall, come, there shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. Okay. Uh, picking up with point five, the first advent confirmed the promise of a savior made to the patriarchs. They knew that down the line, the Messiah would arrive. He would be Jewish, of course, and with the development of things, it turns out that he would be of the tribe of Judah. That's most appropriate. The fourth son of Jacob, son four, not son one. Son one, he 
because of his character and there is certain things about him. Son four is where uh, uh, the genetics of leadership, kingship came out uh, and especially manifested in the life of David. So Jesus' life, death, and resurrection brought realization to the patriarch, arts, on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises to the fathers, the fathers, the founding fathers of the Jewish race, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We might include uh, the sons of Jacob, but we'll just leave it with the patriarchs uh, uh, of the first three generations. Seven, the truth of God refers to the Old Testament scriptures regarding the coming of Christ. All the detail built in from Genesis all the way through that deal with uh, the topic of the first and second advents of Jesus Christ. Of course, the first has been fully and completely uh, realized and all the scripture that related to uh, him, all the detail, it's in the Old Testament. That's what gets me. Any Jews out there listening to this? Religious Jews? If you're liberal and crazy, I'm not talking to you. But for those of you who claim to hold the Old Testament in high regard, read it. It is clear that the Messiah has already appeared once. Read Daniel. Read the other prophets. Look it up. He would come and he would be rejected by the people that should have embraced him. And that's why the Jews were kicked out of their land God using the Gentile Roman authority to make it happen. All prophesied in Daniel. You hold him in high esteem, don't you? That the Messiah would appear and would have nothing. No, no celebration on the part of corporate Judaism of the day. They, he, had all, he had all the credentials, birthplace, parentage, Ancestry, line of David, and other things. It's in the Old Testament. Isn't it amazing how something that is so out in the open can be rejected by people? We've seen it around here. Believer, believers who ought to be able to analyze stuff and get it right when it's presented correctly, over and over again. Since God, point eight, is absolute veracity, nothing in his word can be overturned. He watches over his word. Every detail is covered. Nothing falls to the ground. No promise, no prophecy. No doctrine. It all will stand tall. The fact that the masses reject it doesn't change a thing. The plan is built and takes that into consideration. So Christ appeared to vindicate and fulfill God's promises. Ten, in fact, all the covenants made to Israel depended on Jesus coming on the scene, living a sinless life during his time on earth, and then, of course, wrapping it all up with the cross and the resurrection and ascension. That's in their Bible. It's not just in the New Testament. The New Testament complements it, expands on certain topics, but it's all a unified, both Testaments. His service to Israel proved flawless, thus securing all the promises. The true Jew is one who is not only a racial Jew, but is a regenerate Jew and 
where there is positive volition, like the author of this book of Romans. Uh, he was a Jew's Jew. He was a, he excelled in Judaism of the time. But he finally faced up that he was wrong about Christ and all this that he went through and he, and he turned around and became a believer and a great one at that. So verse 9a reads the Gentiles into the plan of God. Again, there are some Jews, uh, and it historically have been, who don't think the Gentiles have a chance. <laughs> well, that one got over, that's overturned with all these believers that came from the Gentile nations. True, the Gentile nations were out there running amok, but there came a time in history when they would be ready, or a good number of them, ready to hear the plan of God and break from their idolatrous history. 14, in respect to the Gentiles, they are able to glorify God for his mercy. What follows in verses 9b through 12 is a series of Old Testament citations supporting the proposition that Gentiles are blessed with salvation through the Abrahamic covenant. They ought to be able to read that in the Abrahamic covenant. It's in the Abrahamic covenant. That the Gentiles would have a savior as much as the Jews did. The first quotation taken from 2 Samuel 2, 2250 and Psalm 1849, both asserting that the Messiah will sing praises to the Father in the midst of the Gentiles. When's that gonna happen? It hasn't happened yet. There's an incident in the life of Christ where right before he was arrested, right at the end of the observance of the Passover, and they went out from the upper room, they ended their deal like we did Sunday with communion. They ended it with, and, and the, Jesus and his disciples sang a hymn. But this is a record of Jesus uh, celebrating this in the midst of the Gentiles. All believing Gentiles from the dispensations will be brought into the millennium. And according to this quote here uh, in two places, excuse me, in two places, uh, I'm looking up the Psalm 18 one, that uh, Therefore, I will give thanks to you among the nations, O Lord. So you have, a, you have, I will give thanks to you, God the Father, among the nations, O Lord, and I will sing praises to your name. Something else you might not have thought of. Uh, a, a, new, a new little add into this whole thing. When Christ is here on the earth, in the kingdom, he will sing. He will sing praises. We'll be, we'll be doing a lot of singing and praising, both in heaven and back on earth, and celebrating. One of the ways people celebrate things is through song, music, singing. This occurs in heaven in the presence of Gentile believers during the course of the church age and, and probably through the tribulation. Uh, the uh, singing of praises that does not exclude on earth. Giving thanks and singing praise are ascribed to Christ, offered to God the Father here. The second quote is from Deuteronomy 32, 43, and it follows the Hebrew text real closely. The Gentiles are told, step it up here, to rejoice with his people. The Lord's people here would be in this context, Jewish believers. And the Gentiles are told to rejoice with his people, believing Gentiles brought in, which refers to Jewish believers of a previous dispensation. 21, to rejoice is to celebrate. 
the blessed state of Jews and Gentiles in phase three, well, the millennium and onward. It's not going to end. But obviously, there's a lot of celebration going on. Uh, there will be big celebration going on during the, the trib when we're before the throne and Christ is opening the seven seals and onward and upward. There will be a marriage ceremony, some kind of a ceremony celebrating the relationship of Christ to the church age crowd. The only ones at that point that have a resurrection body, basically. And then we'll come back with him. Set up his kingdom. All that you've heard over and over and over again. <clears throat> to rejoice is to celebrate this blessed state. The third quote in verse 11 is taken from Psalm 117, verse 1. 23, this quote enjoins the Gentile believers specifically to utter praise. Verse 11a, followed by command for all peoples to praise him. So we are going to celebrate our good, blessed state as believers in the afterlife, in heaven, on earth, and on, onward and onward. Because when you're excited about something, you let it be known through your speech and other things, and we will. And all of us will have a good voice, too. Even those of us can't carry a tune with help. We will all sing beautifully, like the best professional that was ever out there in our resurrection body. But you don't have to have a good voice to sing praises and to celebrate the plan of God, which we do in two songs every Sunday we meet. We celebrate the plan of God. You're expected to be, that's a part of worship. You're expected to be in fellowship and you're expected to think about what you're singing about. And if your life matches the reality of what you're singing about, that's great. The whole book of Psalms, these are all songs. They don't look like it. How could you sing that? Well, one, it's a different language and they set it up so they can go through it, even, even the real long psalms. They're just full of Bible doctrine, truth, about God, his plan, and various things related to it. They're also a good source of historical information about events. So this quote enjoins Gentile believers specifically to utter praise. It's followed by a command, all peoples praise him. The fourth and final quote, verse 12, is from Isaiah 11.10. And as is it setting, I believe, the second advent, when the kingdom of God will be realized on earth. <clears throat> uh, and again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles. That shoves it up to the where Christ will actually rule, not just control history behind the scenes, like he is the Lord of history. He is that. And everything that's happening, it's working its way towards a resolution and bringing humanity through the most awful time that humanity will ever go through, according to Daniel. There's never been a time like it, and there's been bad times for the human race in different places. But this is worldwide. It covers every nation and every person. No one can escape it. Again, the answer is the same as it always is. Become a believer and figure out what God's will for you to do to where to be, etc., for those that go into the trip. Just like it is today. Nothing changes except it's going to be very traumatic 24 7 for people all over the earth. Again, notice the quote There shall come the root of Jesse. 
and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles. Worldwide rule. Obviously, he's going to rule over the Jews too, but he's going to rule over the Gentile nations, the new nations that will form up and develop when we start off the thousand years. The human race, numerically, will be few compared to what it is going into the trip. Few. I will make mankind scarcer than the gold of Ophir. And all unbelievers will be, at the end, removed from the earth for, for the moment. And those Gentiles that survive from the various nations that are believers, that make it through the tribulation, they get to start up these new nations. So it's going to start small, in that sense, and then these people are going to go out and pioneer nations because everybody on earth that survives the tribulation outside Israel are going to be brought into Israel. I don't care how far away they are and what remote place they're, they're, they're hunkering down in. An angel is going to come knock on their door and transport them through the air that's in there. The angels will go out and they'll find every human believer and unbeliever, everyone of all ages, and bring them all before Jesus Christ. And he will separate them. The believers will be on his right and the unbelievers will be on his left. That's in Matthew 25. The unbelievers who have had all this time to figure it out didn't, they, get, they come under the sin unto death, the baptism of fire. So for a believer standing there looking over to those on the other side, they're suddenly turned to ashes. That's what's left, ashes. Boom, fire out of heaven. And the believers are said, you're blessed. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You can read the details as he sits on a portable, glorious throne that can move like this like some kind of a vehicle, hovering craft. Jesus will sit on it. And the unbelievers will be removed from the scene. He'll have a separate judgment for the, for the Jews who survived the tribulation under the sheep and uh, goats thing. He'll, he'll separate them like a shepherd on a, on a given occasion might separate the sheep from the goats. I guess that's one of the reasons why uh, the occult uses a goat as a symbol for Satan. Yeah. Anyway, the citation identifies the one who is the root of Jesse. Now, Jesse, in the Old Testament, is the father of King David. He had seven sons. David was the youngest. The other boys were apparently being trained to be in Saul's military. They were all this. David, he's, he stuck out there with some sheep. As, a, as, a, as quite a young lad. You know, he wasn't like his upper teens. He was a young lad. And he went out there and took care of his father's sheep during the daytime. And he had to learn how to uh, protect them from predators <clears throat> and help them if they got hurt. They got themselves stuck in something, mud or something. That's what he got to do all by himself. That was his life. That was a part of the trading ground of this young, of this young person. He was being trained for greatness because he had in him something that his other six brothers didn't have, and that is a very strong positive volition. I'm sure they were all believers, but okay. When he was anointed king, he was still too young to function in that capacity. He was, he was anointed by the prophet Samuel. Before, before the family. 
He anointed him as king. So he went out of there. He went out. It didn't go to his head. He didn't get a fat head over it. Okay. What God wants me to do. But I got to go out and take care of sheep right now. I'm, I'm keeping my job until circumstances change. And those things began to change with the Goliath incident. He got in the news. He, he, his name got in lights real quick. It's like, like, like here you are. You, you, okay. He's, oh, he's the youngest of, of Jesse. Well, he got in the limelight real quick and he didn't do anything to make it happen other than he was incensed by the fact that nobody in Israel, none of the, none of the, none of the tough military guys by faith would walk out there and face this nine foot giant. Saul, it, when he volunteered to do it, 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 looked, it looked crazy. And Saul's, oh, they, they wanted to give him a sword and put an armor on him and stuff. He said, no, I'm not trained to do that. See, a fathead would do something like that. Right? Oh, yeah, I'm gonna give me a sword and blah, blah, blah. Have you ever trained with one? No, so I'm not gonna pick one up. I got a weapon. It has killed some real big bad beasts out there to protect the sheep. And I'm good at what I do, but I'm still trusting the Lord, even if I am good. When we were in Israel, based on, there's a guy that has guides to different places called Frommer. Frommer's guide to wherever. And he had one to Israel. And in there, he had a section that said, for all the fake sites that are around, questionable in Israel, this happened here. He said, this one isn't. But it isn't, it isn't, it isn't a tourist stop. And on a, Sunday, on a Sunday afternoon, we drove our rent car out there, and there's a little stream there. And he says, it describes the terrain perfectly. The Jews were on one hill, and the enemies, the Philistines, were on the other hill watching this. The hill the Philistines were on, is there's a hospital on it now. Anyway, so we pull up the road. I got out, walked down. There was no water in the stream now. You know, it's been a long time. But I walked right down to that area, that actual spot where David did in Goliath. Everybody's watching. You can read the account of the Old Testament. Goliath is mocking, and you send this out to me. <laughs> That's about the last thing that came out of his dumb mouth. You were here, I gave you the sound effects, didn't I? <laughs> like this. Well, first David went over and he picked up five not any old rock will work. He picked up five stones that had been in the, in the, in the, around the riverbed, so they were worn smooth and they were the right size. Five is the number of grace. He's, he's, we would say, he's in fellowship and he's doing the will of God. And he puts one in there and he unloads it. And it hit stupid right between the eyes and scrambled his brain. And he fell, I can, I can picture it, falling to his knees and then bam on the ground like that. And David goes over and he picks up a pretty big sword and cuts the guy's head off and holds him up by his long hair. That'll teach you to defy the armies of the living God And then he goes back to his sheep. Just another day in the life of David. And why don't you read it sometime? It's exciting. This was the foretaste that he would then later, as he grew up and became a full-blown adult, was not just an armchair general sitting back and telling men what to do. He got right out into the fight. He fought in Saul's army. They had a pop song back then. 
Saul's killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. It was a popular song. It made it it, it just rattled uh, over over Saul. But he was just doing his job. He wasn't trying to be you know. He was going out there with the armies and leading them and, get, and, and given greater success than Saul was uh, in fighting the, the public enemy number one, which was these warriors, the Philistines. His life was very interesting, to say the least. It comprised a lot of, discuss, a lot of information in the Old Testament. He wrote most of the Psalms. He was, he, he was musically inclined. He could play a harp stringed instrument and sing. He celebrates his physical prowess in one of his Psalms. He says that he could jump over a fence that was, I don't know how high, with ease. He said, God gave me these genetics. And all those years, Saul, when he, when he had, the, when Saul turned on him, when Samuel went to Saul and said, "You're not the king anymore because of your sin of not killing the Amalekites, like you were told to. You find an Amalekite, you kill him. I'm going to exterminate him. And I'm going to use you." Saul wouldn't do this with a group. Samuel killed some of them right in front of Saul. Chopped them to pieces. Bloody. The Malachites were a real bad group. They were very cruel. They didn't just kill people. They tore them apart. They, oh, I mean, they were just, you know. So God called them. That was the, the Malachites were the first ones to attack Israel when they came out of Egypt. That was their first battle as a nation, as a people. So anyway, so, so the citation identifies the one who was the root of Jesse, the father of King David. 60, the root of a plant implies the mature visible plant uh, appearing for all to observe. The root of Jesse is said to both arise and rule over the Gentiles. I mean, you might argue that he arose at the first advent, but he wasn't, he wasn't involved in warfare or anything like that at the first advent. The only things of violence Jesus did while he was on earth was cleanse the temple toys. They were, the money changers were in the temple defiling the place, making money uh, during this, where you had to buy exchange you could god forbid that you would buy uh you know uh your own your own lamb for passover and do it with gentile coins you had to exchange them and they charged you a fee they were making they were making a profit they they were called money changers you made my father's house a den of thieves you shouldn't be making that kind of money off of this that, that, that surcharge. And he wrapped some leather around his hand, hands and he cleansed the temple. Animals and tables were falling over. <laughs> Worth the price of admission. He did it twice in his ministry. That's the closest he came to doing any violence at the first day of that. Oh, he, he destroyed a, he, because of what he did, he destroyed a herd of pigs. Pig farmers. They weren't supposed to be raising pigs. It was a black market operation. And all those demons that were in those two maniacs that ran around in the tombs and cut themselves and everything, he exercised those demons and he put them in those pigs. And they ran right over a cliff and fell in the ocean. And he wiped out a fig tree. That's it. The rest of it was healing people, giving them their eyesight back, on and on and on. Doing the things the Old Testament said, among others, that the Messiah would do. What's wrong with these Jews that are religious 
and praise the Bible like a lot of fundies do, but they won't study it and they won't accept this. It's going to change. The chosen people are going to, a big percentage of them, God is going to remove blindness from Jacob. Jacob is a term used because he, had, he was the father of the founding tribes. So, he, so, they, so one of the expressions in the Bible to refer to Israel is Jacob, to be distinguished from the individual. Okay, we know that, all right? Specifically, those Gentiles who have in time placed their hope in him, quote, unquote. That's where my hope is. It's in Christ for everything. There's where my hope resides. It does not reside in this world system or any of the rest of it. My hope is in Christ. And, and the plan that he is a part of and has revealed to me. That's my hope. I feel sorry for people out there. Not happy for them, but they put themselves in this situation. This hope is available to everybody. But you hear it in songs, you hear it in different ways, that all they can think about is the here and now and, and, uh, and, and, and impending death and all the rest of it, and they have no hope. They're without Christ and without hope. And you, who have been here, you have learned what your hope is. It's not just that you go to heaven when you die. That's a part of it. Or be raptured when the rapture occurs. But all the factors that are involved. All the details. SG3. Ruling and reigning with Christ spending at least minimal, for those of us that are alive when he returns, seven years in the third heaven. And then we'll come back with him and watch him wipe out all these people that gather against Israel, all those nations that should have known better. They had seven years of exposure. This is not a world that can hide anymore from the truth. It is a world that's going, to be it's, it, that's going to be shoved in their faces. And just like today, all these people, all the evidence is that this is real, this is, the, this, is the, this is what you ought to get on board with, and they don't. It's just the same story today. It's just, it would just be more dramatic then with the events I've told you about, the rapture, I think about it all the time. Imagine, imagine, you know, a situation where a person is in a situation and they're resurrected right in front of these unbelievers. It's an old man. He's the end of his life. Suddenly he's a young man. Boom. He may be in a hospital bed. Boom. Right while they're working on him. Yeah. And on and on it goes. You may be wondering about your little kiddos. I would. Imagine that situation when they're resurrected into adults. You're not going to have to change your diapers in phase three and deal with them freaking out because they're hungry or something. <laughs> Somebody's got to be in that situation. Somebody's got to be eight years old. Somebody's got to be that's a believer, I'm saying. Right out there in your public school, if you're in school, in class. Well, there's other kids that are believers. They're going to get theirs. Those that aren't, they can, they can look at it. They'll be given a second chance. But they'll have to work their way through the trip. We're, not, we're promised we won't go into the trip. He will keep us from that hour. Deliver us out from that hour. Okay. Gentiles in the thousand years include those of the age of the Gentiles. That's from Adam to Abraham. All those saints, you know, in, your, in the pre-flood crowd. And down to Abraham. Age of Israel Gentile converts. Like, who can we think of? Nebuchadnezzar, one of my favorites. He didn't become a Jew. He was, he was a Gentile. He finished his career ruling over an empire. 
as a believer. That's how he finished it up. There are other examples in the Old Testament of Gentiles who came to faith. There's a psalm that deals with them. There were positive Gentiles out there, just not a lot of them, but they would come and they would make the long trip. You didn't catch a plane. You didn't catch a, you know, there was not, you, you got caught a ship, you walked, you did what you had to do, and they came because he said, my father's house is a house of prayer for all nations. Gentiles are welcome. They had the court of the Gentiles where Gentiles would come in and that's where they worshiped. They had a specific place for them. And in the Psalm, it talks about different nations where they came up from. Individuals in those nations that were fed up and positive, but fed up with the pagan mess. So you have age of Gentile, you have age of Israel, Gentile converts, of course, church age believers, tribulational believers, and millennial saints. The Old Testament provides ample proof that Gentiles will be accepted, or be accorded, excuse me, full participation in God's plan. They're not second class citizens. And of course, as we know, this is, the, this, is the elite, this is the elite dispensation. Not through any doing of ours. We just stepped into it. We got saved in it as Gentiles. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us in Christ's name.